Okay, so this, uh, are we ready, ladies and gentlemen? This is a talk about Bitcoin. It's an introductory talk. It's meant to be, um, it's going to lie a lot in the name of simplification. In other words, it's going to hide the details in the hope that you get the big concepts. It's going to avoid big words uh, in the hope that in avoiding big words, you'll get a better understanding of what's going on. So here we get to justify Clinton's first announcement. Um, this is the value of Bitcoin. The cumulative value of all Bitcoins currently in circulation. You might notice that the end there, which is now, is $10 billion. And that is a log scale, and it's going up roughly in a linear fashion, which means in a few years it'll hit $10 trillion if it continues in that way. Uh, I don't know whether that's a good measure of a currency's value, seriously. Um, the actual value of currency is used to transact, its total value on circulation is not useful. Um, um, another measure is how much it is used. And this turnover value is an indication of how much it's turned over each day. Now, the scale is wrong, right? So it's never as low as 100 and it's never as high as a million, but it is also going up exponentially, matching roughly what you'd expect with the pool size. So in terms of success, uh, in either value or usage, it's tracking at, oh, well, exponentially. Exponentially is generally good. Um, so if you bought bitcoins in November last year, and we've been through a horrible, horrible session now where we've had the default after fraud, after default, your bitcoins would merely be worth three times what they were in November. Just beware of this. So we go back to this. What is going on? So bitcoins have an awful lot in common with Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. They don't exist, right? They only exist in our heads. They are merely bits on a disk. They have no real value whatsoever. Intrinsic value, yes. They have no intrinsic value whatsoever. Yet apparently, enough people have gone trade, uh, I think, roughly $100,000 each day. Actually, I think it's a bit more than that. Uh, so let's go back and see where this started. And it started a long, long time ago. It started, in fact, when I first joined the internet, um, when it was just a dream. So has anyone here, apart from me, been on the cyberpunk's mailing list? Good Lord, there's two of us. Oh, I'm so proud of Humbug. <laughs> cyberpunk's was an uh, extreme libertarian group. And they postulated all sorts of things. And one of the things was a cryptocurrency. They had no idea how to implement it, but there was a very eloquent spokesman on there called Tim May. He's an Intel scientist. Tim May um, got his fame because he was the one who solved the alpha particle problem for Intel. Turned out that uh, the chips they were making were wrapped in clay that emitted a lot of alpha particles when they moved the plastic, the problem disappeared. And it was Tim May who found out that it was the clay that emitted alpha particles. Very, very low levels, undetectable, but he figured it out. He was then very rich, retired, and then said that we should live in a libertarian world and spoke very eloquently on the subject. A long time later, the dreamers, he's still around, but a mathematician by the name of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce these names, Nick Zabo, actually published a spec 
I don't mean a spec in terms of a um, computer programming spec. I mean a spec as in he's a mathematician. Very few people other than him could possibly understand the spec. And there possibly were a few. But it is generally agreed that his spec and the currency he nominated, BitGold, is going to follow the pattern that I will describe through the rest of the talk. And it was the first one. Late 2008, so we're talking three years later, this guy published a real computer spec that could be understood by computer programmers which contained block formats and ints and chars and OSL dir formats and timings and all the things you actually need to implement a working protocol. And that working protocol looked remarkably like, in fact, most people say it is, Nick spec. Um, in 2011, um, this is 2011, it has just taken off. The man disappeared, whoever he was, and has never, ever been heard from again. We don't know who invented it, he's completely anonymous, and he's no longer contactable. And it's now worth $10 billion. So this talk began as someone asking on the internet, to which I responded to, how do I secure my bitcoins and my bitcoin transactions? And that question displayed such a fundamental disconnect with what bitcoin actually is that I felt compelled to answer it. The reason it's such a fun document is that you do not secure your bitcoins. There are no bitcoins. And the bitcoin protocol secures your transactions, not you. Wrong question. Understandable question if you come from a traditional currency, but it displays such a disconnect with how things actually work that it was worthy of a long answer. So we're going to introduce Mr. Bitcoin. I'll tell you, as the talk goes on, we will expose Mr. Bitcoin more and more and more. But for now, what you need to know about Mr. Bitcoin is he never, ever makes a mistake. He is absolutely trustworthy. He is rich beyond imagining because he controls all bitcoins. And he's good looking too. <laughs> so let's analyze a bitcoin transaction. What happens when someone A transfers bitcoin to B? So Mr. X wants to transfer bitcoins to Mrs. Y. The first thing he asks for her is a thing called a public key. Now, who here knows what a public key is? I'm looking for any hands that aren't raised and there's two marked. <laughs> okay, a public key to, is sort of like the king's seal. You see them in Game of Thrones, where you, all sorts of things, where you put the little stamp on the wax. Everyone who sees a uh, letter stamped with that seal knows it came from the king. They know that because they know what the seal looks like. No one can stamp with the king's seal, supposedly, except the king. So the king's seal is what the king's stamp looks like. And later, the public key is what the king's stamp looks like. And the private key is the physical seal. We'll come to that later. But so the king possesses something that only the king has, and he can use that to mark things that he authorises, and no one can counterfeit it. Except in the digital world, that is, to date, an absolute guarantee. In the king's case, clearly someone could forge the seal, but that can't happen in the digital world. 
So Mr. X then writes a note transferring it. And he said, I'm going to transfer it to Mrs. Y and this is the seal she is going to use should she ever spend them. And he puts that in the note. And he says how many spends, coins he's going to spend. And then he signs that with his private key. So this note, Mr. X has published his seal at some point and he has now stamped this note with his private seal. And only he could have stamped it because only he could have owned that seal. Remember, this is the digital world, so it's not forgeable, even though that sounds utterly fanciful when you talk about seals and wax and bits of lead in the real world. And then he hands that note to our Mr. Bitcoin. So Mr. Bitcoin he then has to go through this thing called the blockchain, which I'll describe to you later, which is simply an audit trail of every transaction. And he adds up everything Mr. X has done. And if his balance of transfers is enough to cover what he has to send to Mrs. Y, he actually adds that transaction to this thing called the blockchain. And the moment he does that, this is a lie, but we'll get to that later. The moment he does that, Mrs. Y owns some bitcoins. So that's all that happened. So let's talk about the blockchain I mentioned. The blockchain is an audit trail. It contains every bitcoin transaction ever done. It starts off at zero and then adds and subtracts things. A transferred to B, B transferred to C, and so on. Okay, the only thing that ever happens to this chain is that people add to the end. It's like every other receipt. You don't add in the middle, you just keep on adding to the end and the balance keeps on changing. And the other property is only our esteemed Mr. Bitcoin, who is unscrupulously honest, uncorruptible, and ever makes mistakes, can ever modify it. So it's always correct. And the final thing is, everyone in the entire world can see it. It's a public document with many, many copies around the world. Anyone is free to download it at any time. Everyone can verify that Mr. Bitcoin is exactly what I said he was two slides earlier. He's honest, he never makes mistakes, and he's a good looking guy. Mrs. Y has asked Mr. X for payment. She wants to ensure that she is paid. How the hell does she do this? Mr. X says, of course, yes, I paid it, it's in the mail. She doesn't look in the mail. She looks at the blockchain, which is a public document. If she sees the transfer to her public, the public key she gave to the text, she has been paid. That is the definition. Remember when I said Mr. Bitcoin added that to the transaction? That's it. It's done. It's over. It cannot be reversed. It's happened. She just watches the public copy of the blockchain and it's done. Yeah, this might seem a little obvious, uh, weird in some ways. You know, I'm talking about bitcoins, but you haven't actually seen a coin. I'm talking about a statement, but there is no statement. And in fact, we've all seen this. Mr. Bitcoin is a banker. So if you're dealing with your bank, what do you do? You log in with your password. It's effectively your key that proves who you are. Um, you write a note to the bank, which is a direct deposit or whatever. And uh, the person who receives it is not going to believe you sent it until they see it appear in their bank statement. This is not unusual. We do this all the time. There's nothing new in how Bitcoin has attacked this problem. Your bank statement never had, well, I sincerely hope your bank statement has never had an item deleted on it. If the bank cocks it up, which they do on occasions, they will reverse it with a new entry and then add the correct entry. 
It is append only, just like the Bitcoin bank uh, blockchain. There is no difference. Mr. Bitcoin can only modify the um, blockchain and the banker can only modify your bank statement. Surprise, surprise, you're not allowed to modify it. You've handed over that authority to the banker. Only he can modify the bank statement. And you are required to believe what is on there. And the money is just pretend. He lends it out again. It never actually is this in the bank. He picks up this, you know, you give him a dollar coin. What does he do? He flips the dollar coin back into his vault. Someone asks for a dollar, he gives it to them. The only record, really, that this dollar ever existed is on his hard disks. Just like Mr. Bitcoin. There is no real currency backing this. He's loaned it out. He's hoping they'll pay it back. If he does, he can pay you back. But there are differences. Mr. Bitcoin will never pay you interest. He only ever charges you. He never loans money, but he can never lose it. He is uncorruptible. He will never, ever steal it. And he doesn't, at least to date, make any mistakes that resulted in anyone losing any bitcoins. You will never have a dispute with Mr. Bitcoin. There is no comeback. Yes, well, all right, so he's a bit perfect. <laughs> a bit like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. He can't possibly exist and he doesn't. So the next part of this talk will explore who the hell and what the hell this Mr. Bitcoin is. Now the answer to this question sort of revolves around the one thing that Mr. Bitcoin can do that no one else can do. And there's only one of those things. He can, only he can append to the blockchain. That he has exclusive control of the blockchain. So who the hell has other people who can have lent to the blockchain? And at this point, everything has sounded sane and everything has sounded reasonable, but the answer I'm about to give will neither sound sane or reasonable. So I want you to bear with me through the next few slides. The answer is volunteers. How do you become a volunteer? You volunteer by solving a puzzle. And that is the sole requirement. Anyone can download the software required to solve this puzzle. Anyone can solve this puzzle. Anyone in this room could be a volunteer today. There is no entry requirement other than you solve the puzzle. And since there's a number of people solving the puzzle, we have to ask, what are the odds of me winning? And the odds of you winning are basically completely random but proportional to the effort you put in. So if everyone puts in the same effort, everyone has exactly the same chance of winning computing the blockchain. But if someone puts in twice as much effort, is you, they've got twice as much chance. We'll explain later on what the word effort means, but that's it in essence. Now, Mr. Bitcoin, our esteemed, wonderful, powerful, non-existent person, makes one other change, and that is he adjusts the difficulty of the puzzle so that on average, it gets solved every 10 minutes. This doesn't mean it's going to get solved. It doesn't guarantee how long it's going to take in any instance. It could take two seconds. It could take half an hour. What he actually does is he goes through and looks at the past few days, looks at how fast the collective unwashed mob has been insulting, and then 
adjust the difficulty of the puzzle accordingly so it takes 10 minutes today based on what they did yesterday. So it's not a guaranteed 10 minutes, it's not even a guaranteed average 10 minutes, but he does his best. What about the volunteers? Why the hell would anyone volunteer to give CPU time to this effort? That's a fairly straightforward answer. They get paid. If, obviously. 25 bitcoins are created at current value. That's about $30,000. Every time you solve the puzzle, which happens every 10 minutes. Currently that means that uh, Bitcoin is handing out on current values about 2.5 million a day to people who solve the puzzles. By any reasonable definition, at this point you'd have to consider them not crazy. That will change later on. But by any reasonable definition, this is not crazy. These 25 Bitcoins are how Bitcoins are created. They come from nowhere. The Bitcoin block stopped at zero, started at zero, and people started mining, and initially the mining fee was 50 Bitcoins. And every time they solved the puzzle, 50 Bitcoins came into existence. So I want you to think about this for a bit. There is some guy, we don't know who he is or where he was, sitting in a room on his own, doing nothing, computer soaking up heat, generating bits that he claimed were worth 50 bitcoins. For a long while, no one paid any attention. They were never traded. Everyone thought, must have thought he was stark, raving nuts. You are running a program on your computer, computing God knows what. And no one traded any of them. This line is when the first trade occurred. So now you have an explanation for that graph. Swing sort of took off from there, really. Okay. It's not the only source of income to the miners. The other source is that when you do a transaction, like when Mr. X transferred to Mr. Y, the balance is not expected to add up to zero. It's expected to be a little couple of bitcoins left over. Uh, not bitcoins, tiny fractions of bitcoins. And that's a tip to the miner. It turns out that even now, tips are running at 2.5 times the value of mining. Don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> but, and this is a good thing, because bitcoins awarded for mining are halving every four years. Not a big thing, but, you know, in about uh, 2140, I think, it goes to zero and it is insignificant long, long before that. So the only fee in the end, and we'll look at this end game very at the very end of the talk, the only fee anyone will get is these tips. This raises a question. Okay, it's a puzzle solving, the first wins, but clearly there are going to be times that two people think they won. It's made worse by network delays. You have a person over here, you have a person over there. There's some people he's closer to, there's some people he's further away. Both get roughly white. They both broadcast, I have the solution! Goes out to people near them on the internet, but people far away see this guy sold it first. And people close to him see that this guy sold it first. 
Um, so what happens? Does Mr. Bitcoin reach down from afar and adjudicate the fight? Well, when you learn who Mr. Bitcoin is, the answer is sort of. Mr. Bitcoin insists you nominate the last block in the chain before solving the puzzle. So we have an audit trail that says, I've collected all these transactions, bang. I've collected a whole pile of money transactions, bang. And it is growing, bang, 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 bang. And he requires you to nominate the last one before you gather your transactions and say, this is my proposed thing I'm going to append. So when the fork happens, it separates. And we have two potential directions the Bitcoin chain could go. And so who adjudicates between these two directions? The answer is no one does. The miners must choose and there is no guidance given. So what happens? Remember the incentive is to earn your mining fees, it's a mere $30,000 a hit every 10 minutes, plus 2.5 times that in transaction fees, you have to solve it first. What are you going to do? You've got two to choose from. Well, you've got no choice at this point. There is no choice. But let's say, as is almost entirely the case, one person finishes before the other. It doesn't happen this time. It will happen exponentially greater probability the next time and exponentially greater probability the time after that. So if we get one tie in a row and then we get two ties in a row, by the time we get to three ties in a row, we're dealing in many, many noughts of probability. The answer is, if that mob over there solves their puzzle before this mob over here, then you're probably going to win by going on and joining that mob. So if this mob over here says, I win, and the one you're on didn't win, you're better off going over and joining this one because that's probably going to be the next thing that's solved. If it started out in balance in the first place, there were more miners over here and miners over here, and the effort is additive, and it's most likely that the person who was over here is going to win. But, so you could just wait for a second, see who groups on the first block and join them. That would be another strategy. The strategy is up to you. Bitcoin doesn't decide or care. The point is, it's like an egg standing on a knife edge. Everyone knows it is going to fall one side or the other. You have no idea which way it's going to fall, but once it starts to tip, it's over Red Rover. There's no point sticking on the other side. You have to choose one side or the other. The system is unstable. You are forced, the entire group is forced to come to a consensus and rapidly. Okay, them's the rules. This is an volatile fact, however, that whoever makes the rules owns the game. So, you know, if I have a Bitcoin of my, what prevents me from reducing the puzzle strength or Christ knows what else? What prevents me from completely upsetting the apple cart and saying, I am going to take over this chain because I'm going to use my rules? Maybe Mr. Bitcoin intervenes. Well, there's a few rules that matter, you know, like how difficult was the puzzle you solved? What was the block you last depended to? What was the, did the transactions add up, right? So, you know, I have to check that if Mr. X, tends, does he actually have those Bitcoins in the entire, is, a, is the format correct? Uh, is it signed properly? Oh, a whole pile of things. There's a lot of things in that block that matter. The funny thing is that everything in that rule book is verifiable once you have a puzzle that's solved. The puzzle actually depends on the block you decided to commit to. So if you decided to commit to this side of the fork, it will record that. If you, obviously it contains all the transactions because that's all it is. 
there's a few bit of meta information, contains all the information you put in there. So you can verify that Mr. X did have the bitcoins to cover Mr. Y. You can verify the difficulty of the puzzle. You can verify he didn't take more mining fees than he should have. You can verify he solved the puzzle. You can verify the transaction. The entire thing was in the correct format. You can verify it was sent via the right protocol. Everything that turns out that is in this rule book, and Bitcoin depends on this, can be verified when you look at a solved puzzle and its associated blockchain. The puzzle, uh, that's a new piece of information, the puzzle depends on the blockchain that you have elected to solve, the block that you have. A miner will only ever, when he's looking at forks, and he decides to accept the block, whether it's a fork or not, it's a bit irrelevant. He will only accept a block in its interest to do so, but this is what Mr. Bitcoin's rules. He will only ever accept a block that conforms to the rule book that he is following. If he is following some other rule book, he will reject it. Now, if he didn't do that, then a possibility is that the person not following the rule book might rip him off for millions of bitcoins. He doesn't want that. This is his only protection. So he will do this every time. He doesn't have any choice in the end. The bottom line is that if I go and change the rules and then I start mailing, there's no rule against that. I can do that. So I have a block over here that I've announced I've solved first, or second, or whatever. Someone else has another rule book over here and they've sold it to a different set of rules. And we check. We have two valid blockchain ends. It looks exactly like the fork we talked about before. And it's solved exactly the same way. If everyone agrees that my rule change is valid, then I win. The rule book is the Bitcoin software. The Bitcoin software, you might recall I already said, was released as an open source project. You can download it and compile it yourself. Everyone can use it and run it. If a proposed change you make isn't adopted by the majority of miners simultaneously, the fork it is on will wither and die just as surely as you lost the puzzle. So the bottom line, you make a change and everyone else doesn't accept it, you've lost. Forget it, you will be ignored. So a real change, believe it or not, is a patch to an open source project, but the patch must have been voted on. You cannot not vote. If you're in the game and you're trying to get your 30,000k each 10 minutes, you either you accept the patch or you don't, and that's a vote. You cannot not vote. The vote only runs for 10 minutes. Maybe the Australian Electoral Commission could learn something from that. And the vote is in some sense forced to be completely democratic. Every miner will get a say proportion to the amount of effort he has put in, guaranteed by the protocol. Requires no Mr. Bitcoin. Requires no outside man with guns. It is just a set of rules that are self-reinforcing that if everyone, well regardless of whether anyone follows them, because if someone tries not to follow them, they are immediately excluded from the game. Bitcoin is in some ways a magical thing. It's a set of rules, mathematically precise rules, sort of like a law, but expressed in software, Software is the rule book. 
and the policeman, and unlike our police, it investigates every crime and discovers every violation. It's not the executioner. The executioner arises out of the interaction between the swarm. But the executioner, nonetheless, is just as dramatic. It's sort of a society, I guess, based on open source and patches and what have you, reinforced with a very, very clever set of rules. Okay. So now we, I've painted, I hope, is a, a picture that thinks maybe this could work. Now, maybe this is actually possible. Maybe we can make Santa Claus actually worth something. Maybe the tooth fairy is real. It's possibly wise to remember at this point that if enough people believe in Santa Claus, it will move hundreds of billions of dollars. And it won't even move them from Christians, it will move them from Chinese, Muslims and everyone else. The power of a whole pile of humans believing in an, the one thing is quite an extraordinary thing. Now, whether it makes sense or not in Hitler's Germany, who knows. But don't underestimate this power for good or evil it can have. Just merely having a belief that it can work is a big thing. The most critical thing, the real thing that Bitcoin can suffer from is a blockchain takeover. So if I have, I'm a miner, and I suddenly describe a way to find a way to put in more effort than every other block miner out there combined, then I get the most votes. I can do whatever I bloody well like with the blockchain. It's not a theoretical. Um, people don't just come else it may actually be as low as 30 something percent of the power out there because it's a random process. However, a mitigating factor is there are orders of magnitude more effort being shown at mining now than any other computing problem on the earth ever. Now, that is a hard thing to believe. So this little hidden graphic here, if I can find my mouse. Here it is, my mouse, there it is. And I hover over this. That <laughs> It's a very old mining rig. It's only based on FPGAs. So that gives you a hint. It, you know, if you're in a Scandinavian country, there is no need for room heating. That is what a mining rig a few years ago looked like. You may think it's a joke. It's not a joke. Right, let's get an appreciation for the amount of effort. The solution, they are, the puzzle, for those of you who understand, is the same puzzle we use to encrypt passwords. It's an SHA hash. Currently, we are computing 35 million billion hashes. This is the blo entire blockchain network per second. That is the amount of effort that has been thrown at this problem. It's, it turns out that 3.2 million a day is a bit of a fright. People compete for it. The way this worked is originally there was one man in his room with just a little laptop and he solved the block every problem so he throw almost nothing at it. But suddenly, as you saw, there was a vertical line and then there was competition. One of the things in those vertical lines, by the way, was a man who paid, um, I think, 15,000 bitcoins for a pizza, roughly worth 
ninety million dollars in today's money. <laughs> uh, to give you a bit more of a feel, as I said, these things are used to store passwords, and there are, there have been this same puzzle. So it's not an untested puzzle; has been tested over and over again with people reverse engineering passwords. Um, all you do is you try every possible password. If you assume you didn't try every possible password, you just have tried six-bit passwords, which is the printable characters, roughly. Then the current limit, if you give someone a few weeks, might be 10 or 12 characters. You know, um, a few weeks, if you've got a 10 or 12 character password, they're going to try every possible combination. They extend that maybe a bit more by only testing you with words and stuff, but if you're careful, you won't hit that, so it's a problem. If this amount of horsepower, which exists now, every 10 minutes, solving Bitcoin hashes was showing that problem, your 21 character password would be cracked every two seconds. And there's no assumptions here, it's completely random. So the claim that more ingenuity and horsepower is being shown at this problem than we have ever seen on the planet before by all of the magnitude is not an idle claim. It is now at the point that they are using custom silicon. They went through the point of using ordinary CPUs, then they went to um, GPU cards. The rig you saw before was in fact an FPGA setup. We're now into the second generation of custom silicon ASICs. In order to take over this blockchain, you have to double that. It may be possible. I, I'd like you to think about what happens if it is possible at some stage, because it's actually an interesting question if someone actually pulls it off. Okay, there's a lot of other issues with Bitcoin, right? That's not the only one. But that's the really easily identifiable one. People carry on about deflation. And what they mean by deflation is that some economists think that a uh, currency where everything goes up in value, depends how you put it, I guess, but becomes less and less expensive, in other words, your money grows worth more and more and more is a bad thing because you are encouraged to hold on to your money. Um, I can't comment on that really, I'm not an expert, but I will make two points. The first point is that no currency to date in any society has been destroyed by deflation. Quite a few have been destroyed by the inflation, inflation is possible in Bitcoin, but none has been destroyed by deflation. They also, you'll see claims that um, growth isn't possible with deflation. There was a time, not this century, not the last century, century before, where the currency was stand tied to the gold standard. Because uh, it was tied to the gold standard, they could not create currency. They were in a period of deflation in the US. It was the strongest growth the US has ever experienced in that time. Um, that's still not to say that deflation is not worse than inflation. I suspect that it is. You would be better off with steady inflation. I hard, mind you, Bitcoin shakes so many preconceptions, you do wonder, isn't that true? But that's my preconception. But I don't think the effect is large. It has a horribly, horribly inefficient protocol, which is to say it's a broadcast. So any time you want to communicate everything, you have to send every packet to every miner. Every time any miner answers, I want to broadcast to every other person out there. Uh, it, it can't scale. It won't scale. It'll never scale. It's a complete... Uh, yeah, but there's nothing about the original Bitcoin code that was pretty. Nothing. This is just another aspect of it. Total pool size. Um, the total pool size is in fact 52 bits. I've been talking about it in terms of bitcoins and all that. Bitcoin is some multiple of the smallest divisible value. I don't know what it is. 
The problem with it is you need a total pool size that can cope with the transactions around the world, which is measured in trillions of dollars per day. Yet on the smallest transaction, you have to be able to charge a transaction fee that is like point, realistically 0.01%. The smallest transaction, I don't know what it is, but you know, if you want to buy a sort of one oh, 10 cent lolly, then you have to have a, the smallest division of 0.01% of that. And I, I, I haven't looked at the arithmetic, it's all, but 52 bits seems con very constrained. 52 bits probably seems like a very odd number to anyone who's heard, you know, why not 64 or 32? Uh, 52 bits is what neatly fits in a float. No one's actually, he's ne the guy who now has disappeared has never said why he chose 52 bits, but it's a remarkable coincidence that it fits neatly in an IEEE plate. And IEEE does begin to arithmetic change the truth. How odd. Yeah, there's this guy who's disappeared off the planet. Remember, he sat there for over a year mining bitcoins at the peak rate where no one was taking any interest. He holds enormous number valued in excess of a billion dollars at least at the moment. Ah, he could destroy it in one stroke. It is. I, I don't know what to say, except if you look at this man um, and you look at the history, he can't write code. <laughs> He's atrocious. He's obviously very good at maths. He has absolutely no interest in the fact that he owns a billion dollars worth of thing and he's just gone off, he considers it irrelevant, the case proved, I've made my point. This man is probably a mathematician. <laughs> and if he is, it's unlikely he has any interest in that billion dollars whatsoever. Uh, this is my personal pet peeve with Bitcoin. You might remember that I said the blockchain size, you have to go through every block. It's an unlimited audit trail, okay? They're managing now. Actually, they're not. We'll come back to that later. But in principle, it, in fact, most people manage now. Um, but it's going to grow. Interesting thing about that and in deflation. Deflation can be solved very simply. Deflation means that people tend to want to hold their Bitcoin. The solution to trying to prevent someone from holding their bitcoins is to make them worth slightly less than they were a little while ago. If you deflate them by 0.001%, every blockchain solvent, the problem goes. Interestingly, and you say, well, okay, where would the money go then? Well, you give it to the miners. The miners are paid through the inflation. And the problem disappears for deflation. Right. You don't need a big amount of deflation to get 1% per year. That means the miners have paid 1% of this X trillion dollars pool a year. It's a lot of money. <laughs> X trillion being sort of, I don't know what the number is after trillion, <laughs> but it's 1% of that. So it's several trillion dollars. Um, the blockchain size can be solved by ensuring that after a while, um, no matter what, your transaction will expire to zero. So deflation is solved by a steadily nibble, 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 nibble. It might go on forever for a large transaction. Deflation, this thing here is solved by, well, we'll let you keep it at the inflation rate for a year. But after that, it's going to keep on increasing. At the end of four years, it's going to be zero. What does that do? Well, not much really, because at any time you can just put a new transaction in. And that gets rid of all the old transactions. But what that means is you have a blockchain that can has transactions that are no more than four years old. Suddenly, the blockchain is no more than four years long. And the problem becomes manageable again. Now, the thing about all these problems, is that they all have solutions and Bitcoin can, has, and does change. 
There's $10 billion worth of Bitcoins out there. If someone thinks that it's worth their while to modify the protocol that they maintain their value, it's the majority think. They can change the rules as they please to alter, to solve these problems. And that kicks in in a really big way if we go back to here. Because this seemed like an insurmountable problem. But in reality, to accumulate that amount of horsepower, you will be noticed. It's impossible to soak up that amount of silicon from a limited number of suppliers. No one else is going to buy it, spend a huge amount of money and not be noticed. So how does the mutability of the Bitcoin rules work? Well, the only reason they can achieve this rate is it's highly specialised silicon solving one puzzle. So you change the puzzle. How do you change the puzzle? You change the Bitcoin rules. If someone sees this problem sneaking up, that's what will happen. He has to react before anyone can react with a change in Bitcoin rules. So it puts an upper bound on it. And the problem becomes much, much harder to take over. Okay. So far to date, everything I've told you about Mr. Bitcoin has been true. No Bitcoin has been lost because Mr. Bitcoin has made a mistake. The audit trail has been a perfect historical record of what actually happened. All right, it's not quite true. They've had bugs. It leaked Bitcoins. All sorts of things. But they went back and fixed it and everyone agreed to change the protocol so it worked. So when it didn't matter, they had bugs because this guy couldn't code to save his life. But now, it's now taken over by a rather large team of your average open source programmers and the code quality is improving rapidly and no one's found a bug for quite a while uh, except in OpenSSL. So, <laughs> yeah, it does, and you already know the answer because I've already shown you the slide before, except for Raymond here. <laughs> but what, given that's true, and everything you read about Bitcoin is a bloody disaster, how did this happen? Now, I'm asking someone, I'll, I'll ask Raymond because he didn't actually see the answer. Well, it's very simple. Let's assume it's your bank account and you find your bank account too complex to use. So what you do is you give your bank account password to a very pretty website and they promised you a very small password which you can name after your cat. <laughs> um, so, under that scenario, let's, we've already talked about this, sorry to bore you, but there's at least one person that hasn't. Let's talk about how to do it. So we have had instances of Bitcoin exchanges that looked after these uh, public and private keys for them where they didn't actually take any backups at all. And each of these losses are measured in the typically hundreds of thousands. That has happened several times. We have, of course, had the excellent case of Linode. Linode um, unbeknownst to Linode, I suspect, ran several Bitcoin exchanges. <laughs> Linode let their administration part for the entire Linode cloud leak. Hackers got in there, knew there were Bitcoin exchanges running. Of course, the keys are in the Bitcoin exchanges, aren't they? They see the transactions. They empty every wallet on every Linode Bitcoin exchange. Linode denied that this could possibly have happened for a while. That's happened. We have numerous cases of scammers who have just put up pretty looking websites. People have handed over their Bitcoin and banking passwords and walked off. One of the early ones was run by a miner. No one ever knew. But I guess they never asked. <laughs> it's the only possible way it could happen. 
To secure your Bitcoin transactions, you just need to keep your private key private. That's all you have to do. It's 1K of data. You put it on a USB key, you put it in a password, you put it in your bank. A recommended procedure is to print it out in hex and absolute desperation form and then put it in a bank deposit box. It's all you have to do. These people didn't do that. Um, among other techniques used is simply losing your key. So maybe you read the headlines about this uh, English gentleman who in the early days mined a whole pile of bitcoins through the laptop and out after he showed out with Norman and he had $7 million worth of bitcoins on the hard disk. <laughs> they are, by the way, gone forever as bitcoin stands. Um, once you've lost the keys, it's not only lost to him, it's lost to bitcoin. If we had the uh, blockchain limited link thing, they would eventually come back. I think so they hit the four year or whatever limit and then they'd be given to miners and they'd re-enter the circulation pool. Um, so there are solutions. Uh, as I said, uh, and then and there's one I'm going to talk about now in detail. There's no more lines for it, but it's interesting because it illustrates many of the concepts that I've talked about so far in the talk. So I don't know how many you know, but yesterday Mount Crop Gox filed for bankruptcy. A few days before that, they were the largest Bitcoin trader on the planet. And the immediate question is, how did this happen? Those of us who are programmers and know a bit about security, we read that the guy who ran Mount Gox read, wrote his own SSH server in PHP and then deployed it on his production systems. The rest was not a surprise. <laughs> 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 now, for some people, you can see people are laughing at this, and, but for those people who don't get the joke, we now go into the boring nitty-gritty detail. Um, there was such a thing as a transaction malleability flaw. Now, what this meant is that when people verified the transaction, it arrived in a computer packet, binary packet, and they unpacked it, right? And they said X, $200, blah, 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 blah. And then they looked at the unpacked form and they said, this is what the transaction is. So if you want to think about it in terms of bank statements, I go along and I get the bank statement from my bank and someone asks for a copy of it, so I scroll out in handwriting form, I say, yep, it's the same bank statement. You can authorise this. The beginning balance and the end balance is the same. You can match it up against the bank statement. It's the same bank statement. Look, sorry, I don't have a photocopy of this, is it? Um, in some ways, this makes sense because the numbers are the own and the numbers and the keys and what have you, the only thing that matters. So they're the only thing that they ever check in this history thing. Uh, they decided that possibly this wasn't so good. It was noticed in 2011, uh, last year, about a year ago, even almost to the day actually, uh, they decided that they should fix it. It wasn't a deliberate feature in Bitcoin. Uh, it turned out because it's an uh, open SSL problem. Uh, the format they were using was open SSL DIR format, for those who want to know what it is. The format has a number representation which allows you to have leading zeros. Does. Does. So, what happened? Well, they fixed the bug and the vote was taken and all the miners started using the new software and that was over. Mount Gox doesn't use the normal daemon. They use their own version. Apparently they were told, well, the developers claimed that they tried to contact Mount Gox, but apparently, so they claimed they were, well, they didn't hear back. Mount Gox claims that they are unaware that it happened, they just noticed some mild discrepancies. Um, what actually happened is that, let's say that I um, want to sell some Bitcoin. So, what I've got to do is I've got to give that Bitcoin to Mount Gox. 
It's like any trader, right? I have to actually physically transfer it to Mt. Gox's control. Equally, I'll find on Mt. Buy Bitcoin, I have to transfer the money into Mt. Gox's account. And then um, I put in a bid at X dollars for Bitcoins. And if someone accepts it, the money gets changed to Bitcoins less than Mt. Gox's thing. And then I have to transfer the Bitcoin out. They might send me an email or something. So this is, this is fair enough. So I transfer my Bitcoins into Mt. Gox because I want to sell them. Mt. Gox says, oh, look, it's in my wallet now. You want to sell them for X dollars? We'll see if anyone uh, wants to. Oh, look, someone accepted the bid. I'll transfer it to them. It's got leading zeros in it. Mt. Gox has been extraordinarily tardy at every point actually giving anyone any money out of their accounts. <laughs> um, so what then happens is that the person sees the transaction go out and they know full well, because the entire Bitcoin community except Mt. Gox knew about this, that Mt. Gox's transactions weren't formatted correctly. So they fix it. They alter and they delete all the leading zeros, but since that's not included in the book block came signature, uh, the signature, that's fine. It passes. They give it the second transaction to the blockchain. It gets accepted and they say, oh shit, it's accepted. Right, I want my money. There's no money in my account. Eventually they get the shits and they ring Mount Gox. And it says, fuck. Now, the reason... <laughs> The reason they say that is that there's no guarantee that this transaction will be picked up by any miner. Now, this is an understood part of the protocol. In part of the protocol, there is an expiry time for every transaction. Now, imagine that I'm going to pay Clinton and I'm mistakenly paying $16 billion for this dinner tonight. And I say to Clinton, Jesus, Clinton, don't, don't do anything about that. And here's the correct amount. If that transaction doesn't expire, even though I've given Clinton his money, being the asshole he is, he'll probably go and collect the $16 billion tomorrow. There's an expiry in every Bitcoin header that says, after so many blockchains have been solved, this e transaction is no longer valid. Well, Mt. Gox didn't use that. <laughs> so, what they did is retry the transaction. And then it worked. <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they noticed there were a few minor discrepancies. And that's what they announced on their website. They shut down a couple of weeks ago. And then a week ago or so, they announced the minor discrepancies amounted to $350 million. It was a simple bookkeeping error. I'm sure anyone could have made it. You pay someone twice, you know, it's a bookkeeping error. What can you do about it? And then they're bankrupt. So <laughs> <laughs> it's probably worth remembering at this point that Mt. Gox was founded when there was a total of 240,000 Bitcoins in circulation. And prior to that, they circulated magic gathering of the exchange playing cards. That's what their software is. It was a PHP program. You show up this cool website and everyone he thought he was wonderful. Gradually it grew and they were actually a few weeks before they went bankrupt, they had circulated a document listing an IPO pointing out that they had made hundreds of millions of dollars, which they had. Unfortunately, it was all lost. Um, so this was another account. Now, again, you're looking, well, all these people who had their bitcoins or dollars sitting in Mt. Cox lost out. Anyone with half a brain does not leave any of that sitting in a broker's account for any length of time. I don't know who's going to wear this. I, I don't know how they could have accum accumulated 700,000 bitcoins or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, again, it's a stockbroker. It's not a stockbroker, it's a Bitcoin broker. He went broke. He's not a bank. There's no guarantees. He's in Japan. Get in the creditor's queue and line up. <laughs> is the only advice I can offer. Um, 
Um, the one, well, remember, the big, you see, there's more to it than that, actually, Clinton, because uh, they're based in Japan. Japan, you know, is, is run by rule of law. It doesn't matter. When you go and try and do any transaction with Bitcoin, they are subject to anti-money laundering laws. So if you deal with them, and I have, you have to give them your passport, your driver's license, and a whole pile of other ID information. They know exactly whose Bitcoins they double spent. The problem is that the transactions are normally for below 100 bucks and they've shown 350 million. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the real reason they didn't redeem the money is they couldn't keep up with the transaction flow and that was just in a normal daily business. Now the reason this is interesting, the concept of what I talked about earlier, is what happened was a blockchain fork. The winners won, the losers got left behind, and in this case didn't notice. <laughs> the protocol changed, their blocks got rejected by the miners. They were checking the blocks that came in and they said, screw off, this isn't, it was just a formatting error. This isn't formatting as it should, piss off. The users said, Christ, I know about this, I'll fix it. Interestingly, um, the people who received the bitcoins twice didn't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. It's a, it, it's a fairly simple accounting error. Uh, yeah, only a PHP programmer wrote an SS8 server would do it. <laughs> so that ends. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that ends the discussion on Bitcoin as it is now. I hope after this talk, you all have a genuine insight into why it's actually at $10 billion, right? It's, it's, it's a bit different from anything we've seen before. So, and that ends, I guess, the factual part of my talk. So what starts now is only a couple of slides of pure speculation, but the speculation is, where to now? We know what this thing is, we have an idea. Where could it possibly go? Bitcoin, as it turns out, is in competition with a whole pile of things. And I've chosen three attributes, somewhat arbitrarily, well not arbitrarily, I think they're most important, but uh, I think everyone would agree that they are, might have different, that are most important in a currency. The first one is liquidity. Liquidity is the ability to exchange a currency for other goods. It's how fluid it moves, like can I purchase cheese, oil, dollars, baht, ringgit for this currency. If it is easily to do that, it's highly liquid. If it's hard, it's not highly liquid. Stability. If I pay X Bitcoin for a loaf of bread today, it'd be really nice if it was X Bitcoin tomorrow. As Bitcoin currently stands, it could be X by two Bitcoin tomorrow or X divided by two. So Bitcoin doesn't really have this yet. And the third one is, how much does it cost me to use this currency? So we look at cash. And, you know, everyone thinks that cash is king. You know, it's obviously highly liquid, everyone accepts it, doesn't change in value, zero transaction fee. Um, probably a counterbalance to that is that cash is going out of fashion. That can't be true. If they're the measures we're using and that determines the usability of cash, it must be failing somewhere because otherwise, why would we be people using credit cards and pay pass and what have you? What's going on? So let's talk about liquidity first. Liquidity is the ability to exchange something. I go up to Clinton and I demand a meal. Um, I have to have the cash in my pocket to demand the meal. If I don't, I have to get it out of a bank account. If I do have it, and Clinton rips off as he usually does, I'm going to have to have an awful lot of money in my bank account and then it can be stolen because it's a bearer bond. A bearer bond is something that only gets to keep. So 
it's not actually as liquid as you might first think, right? You've got to actually go to the bank and get it. You've got to pre-prepare for it. You've got to think about it. If you think about PayPass, where I don't have to think about it, I just carry this bloody piece of plastic in my mind and I go, beep, beep, beep. I never worry about refilling. I never worry about anything. No, credit cards, PayPass in particular, is far more liquid than cash. What about stability? It, it wins the stability. Transaction fees. Well, it's free, isn't it? You try telling that to a person who accepts a store that accepts a lot of small currency. They have to train their staff. It gets stolen, so they have to put it in safes. Every person on the till every day has to count out the till and they have to balance it. Then they have to take it to the bank and then they have to balance that. It goes on and on and on. It may well be easy for us, the users, but for a store it's not free. And if Bank transfers. Now, let's talk about Australia first. Liquidity. Well, uh, if they have a bank account, and particularly on the internet, they all do, uh, it's pretty liquid in Australia if you're transferring to an Australian account. It's dead, drop dead easy. <laughs> Stability. Stable as cash. Bloody wonderful. Uh, transaction fees. In Australia, there's none. This is a drop dead mazair, and for that very reason, You'll never see Bitcoin, in at least as it is in Australia, take over from cash as stored by banks. Just the banks are stable, really. They're just like Mr. Bitcoin. Ah, uh, credit cards. They win on liquidity. Stability, the same as cash. Transaction fees, they're very high. Right, they're at least um, one or something percent. I don't know probably a lot more, depending on who you are. Okay, Bitcoin, liquidity, shithouse at the moment. May well change. Um, certainly it's easy to exchange with Australian dollars and other currencies, uh, but the thing you can buy is not much. But that, you know, if it became popular, it's a self-defining problem. That may well change. Stability. Words cannot express how unstable it is. Transaction fees, potentially almost zero. Uh, it, it doesn't look too rosy when you compare it to the situation in Australia. If I compare it to the situation in the US with just, say, bank transfers, they're not free. They're almost impossible to do. The, as soon as you go outside your bank, US competition, one little thing it is, you have to, difficult to transfer money. You have to write a check, you get charged with a check. The check can be stolen. The people wrought checks. You know, there's no Mr. Bitcoin checking checks. It's all a bit of a mess. If you try and transfer money out of Australia, as I have done, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, it's almost impossible not to have at least 50 or 60 dollars stick to some friggin' banker's fingers on the way through. This is a large fee. And in fact, one of the things... Sorry? Well, if I transfer a thousand dollars PayPal, I've ended up with 27 dollars in fee. It's not as cheap as Bitcoin can be. Uh, I think this is the essential point. If Bitcoin solves these two problems, this one will win. Actually, I dispute that. And the reason I dispute that is that the people are running Bitcoin, well, this is in the next slide, have an incentive to match this competition. The people who run the fiat currencies are the governments. They have no incentive to make overseas transactions cheap. And they... It does? All right. So why do I have to fill in a piece of paper if I shift $10,000 out of Australia? I do not have to do the same thing. And how... Well, we can get to that... They are lying. They're lying. <laughs> they're lying. 
They are lying because they can't track it. They know when you're moving currency to Bitcoin. They don't know when you're moving Bitcoin or how often times you move it. While it remains in Bitcoin, they know nothing. I can generate a new key for each transaction. Yeah, well, these two are a huge problem, right? These two, at the moment, are just a joke. Uh, well... No, credit card, okay, I'll agree with that. Credit card is not a currency, right? Credit card... Yes. Absolutely. There's nothing, and PayPal could base it on... Um, yeah. Yes. They could have. They may as well have. It would be worth as much. <laughs> yeah, credit cards are, credit, there's a lot more to credit cards. We pay for convenience of credit cards because they are offering a service that is well and beyond what Bitcoin, well, what cash can offer. Bitcoin, believe it or not, well, I've skimmed over a few details. <laughs> One of the details is that when you submit a transaction, it can contain a computer program that authorises that transaction. <laughs> ah, I don't know whether it's not, to be honest, Raymond. I have no idea whether it is. But you can certainly do tricks like, uh, um, I only accept it when six people authorise it. I only transfer it via a third party if the third party accepts it. Um, liveness tests, I only allow it to last for this amount of time and a whole pile of other, it includes signature checks and a whole pile of things. Whether I haven't mentioned it because I have no idea, it's, it, it hasn't been used, and I have no idea whether it will ever be used to implement all the other things that might be implemented on top of it. But it is there. Um, uh, the one thing, for obvious reason, is the language has no loops. So it has a finite guaranteed execution time. That is there. And so um, it is perfectly possible, by the way, for these million bitcoins to disappear publicly. Because the... Oh, oh yeah. See, this is on. Yeah. Because the way you spend them is to write a program. <laughs> you can't spend them without writing a program. Uh, and the program can be returned. Which means that no one gets the money, it just disappears. There's a bit of speculation that one day he might do that if he's a true mathematician. <laughs> Um, anyway, so you compare this as, as Roman would say, credit cards are different. People are offering you credit, they're guaranteeing payment. Bitcoin takes at least, it doesn't take 10 minutes, that's a lie. Um, you have to go through several blocks to be written. I mean, realistically, most people say an hour. By the time an hour has gone by, the probability of it being reversed is infinitesimal. Now, um, if you compare it to bank transfers, it's 24 hours, right? So it's not bad, it's just not I can walk in and buy something and wave my card type of thing. Or several days. Uh, that will be a pleasant change in Australia. It won't apply to the rest of the world. Um, international transfers will still be the Wild West. 
I don't think there's much of a thing. If I want, we, I was hoping, and we hopefully will, I'll pay Clinton for the meal he shared at me tonight in Bitcoins from a fresh account that we will create and anyone who wants to watch on can see. Um, but this is an absolutely stupid use for Bitcoins. <laughs> right. Cash is just, in Australia, so much better. All right. Um, so we've talked about these, but Bitcoin is going to, one assumes, continue. And so the question is, what's going to happen? And it turns out there is a whole pile of Bitcoin competitors out there. In fact, there is a website that you go and feed in your name and a few other details and it creates a new set of Bitcoin software and you mint your own coins. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> Wonderful. The startup cost for an altcoin is zero. And there's so many of them. Surprise, surprise. None of them have achieved the success of Bitcoin yet. Uh, PayPal currently makes, I believe they returned to eBay last year, $1.3 billion. That's not too different from what Bitcoin is returning to its miners right now. Um, you know, possibly double. And that will probably be erased in the next year. And then it will be the same. But there's a lot of money that sticks to people who handle this cashless fingers. Um, but they get a fair whack of this money out of mining fees. And that's going to disappear. So let's think about for a second what the transaction fee does. And the incentive for the transaction fee is that a miner has to pick up your transaction. If you broadcast your transaction, it, they are free to ignore it or choose it as they want. In order for your transaction to be included, a miner who wins the puzzle has to accept your transaction. Let's accept that there are no mining fees at the moment and you pay nothing. It ain't going to happen. Uh, so you're going to have to pay something for a miner to pick up your transaction. Um, but there's 1.3, but what can the miners charge? And the answer is the miners can charge as much as the market will bear and probably will, right up to this 50 or $100 that sticks to the banker's fingers as you try to transfer crap through the international banking system. So they'll come in a little bit below that, assuming all things are equal, because they want to be cheaper. Um, but that assumes there's no altcoins. If there is an altcoin, I'm paying 50 to $100, and I recently paid this on behalf of Linux Australia to transfer some money from a sponsorship to PyCon, and that's another reason for this talk, is it really, really gave me the shits. Because I took all the risk, right? There's no way if this transaction goes wrong that anyone can get the money back. It's just an international transfer. They have transferred a few bits over a wire and they've charged me 50 or 60 bucks to do it. <laughs> There's a little difference between the cost of executing the transaction and the cost that I was charged to do it. And most of this is because of the government rules and regulations protecting the transactions. There's a few in Australia, if you're in China, they actually fix the currency. They have a whole pile of incentives to prevent um, currency drifting up and down, and they all use it to control the national interests, which collide with the transaction fee interests. And that's, I suspect, why it costs so much. People say, oh, but it's a lot safer. Eh, it is at times, and when it is safer, the money's probably deserved, but when it's not, I want to pay half a cent for my transfer, which is what it costs to send the packet, after all, not 50 bucks. And that is the price difference. Price difference won't be reached 
while Bitcoin is competing against that price difference. It won't be 50 bucks, it'll be $49.99. As soon as another altcoin comes into consideration, there is a race to the bottom. You have two, assuming they're equal, they're going to compete on transaction fees. Then we will see some real competition. Now, who will establish an altcoin? Um, it could be a bank with a large customer base, seeing their profits eroded by Bitcoin. It could be a country like Singapore that just says, bugger this, um, we're being hit too hard. There's a whole pile of ways to get a user base for an altcoin if you wanted to. Given the money involved, which is mentioned in millions and millions, billions of dollars in transaction fees, I, I just can't believe that it won't happen. You will get a whole pile of altcoins out there. So suddenly you are paying transaction fees to an altcoin. And what are you paying for? You're paying for liquidity and stability. Because that's how you're going to choose it. I want the most liquid, stable thing. That's what I'm going to use for a price. So they will be forced to become liquid, stable and cheap. And unlike the fiat country currencies in the international market, the Australian government couldn't really give a shit about how the Australian dollar competes against the US dollar. These people will live or die in a competitive market by how competitive they are at delivering these two for that price. I guess uh, you can guess where I think that is likely to lead. Uh, that was, I went around this in the wrong order. Who determines the transaction fee? The answer is the customer, obviously, in the end. When there's several altcoins, you choose what to pay. And the miners either accept or reject it. It's a buyer's market. Thank you. I could ask if there's any questions, but we've had lots of questions, I think. Is there any? How many do you have? I don't know. Where's mine? <laughs> Damn, oh, where's we can mine? we can arrange for you to have some real soon now. <laughs> <laughs> so Clinton, I'm about to pay Clinton for dinner. If anyone's interested. Are we done? We are done.